very good evening friends so i hope all of you are doing well safe and healthy so we've got a very interesting topic for discussion today and that is the discussion on schedule 3 and typically we're going to talk in terms of uh, division 2 so in any case i presume that you know many of you must have uh, you know just passed the ca intermediate and preparing for ca final and uh, you may not be very conversant with the concept of division 2 though i believe that you are all aware of uh, the division 1 uh, which is given in schedule 3 which is required to be you know which is the financial statements which are made as per the companies which follow accounting standards but when you look at division 2 it is the format of financial statements which is meant for companies which follow indices so what I'm going to do uh, on the presumption that you are quite aware in terms of division one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, you know, uh, transit in terms of uh, the division two. So when I'm going to transit in terms of uh, division two, uh, in this particular case, I'll give you the movements, you know, what are the changes from division one to division two. Uh, so I'm not saying that we're going to get into a huge depth in terms of concept but yes uh, you'll certainly feel confident today after a discussion on the concept of uh, the division two gets over today uh, let me just uh, share the whiteboard with you so to begin with the uh, first of all what i'm going to do i'm going to first of all show you the division one and then I'm going to show you division two so that we can see, you know, a little transition change in terms of division one and division two. So I'm also sharing the documents in terms of division one and division two. So first of all, if you have a look at the division one, uh, you can see uh, that division one deals with financial statements for a company whose financial statements are required to comply with the company's and it says in the brackets accounting standard rules 2006 that means uh, division one is meant for you know uh, financial statements formats are given for a company which follows accounting standards now correspondingly you know there has been a rules under the companies act 2013 and these rules are called the company's as rule 2006 which has been amended a couple of times since 2006 Similarly, if you just have a quick look in terms of Division 2, you can see in terms of Division 2, we are given the financial statements for a company whose financial statements are drawn in compliance with, it says the companies and the bracket, it says Indian Accounting Standard Rules 2015. And there has been a couple of amendments, you know, since 2015 to these rules as well. Uh, but the basic, uh, you know, rules which, you know, give the format in terms of the Companies Act is called the Companies India's Rules 2015. Now, before we come to the discussion on Schedule 3 Division 2, let's have a little look in terms of Division 1, which you're already quite familiar with. So if you notice in terms of the balance sheet format, which is given in Division 1, uh, it starts with the heading called Equity and Liability. And I guess if you look at, uh, you know, a little within the heading of equity and liability, uh, you can see that we are given the shareholders fund. Shareholders fund is nothing but it is synonymous in terms of equity. You know, whether you call it as equity or you call it as a shareholders fund or you call it as an own funds, it means one and the same thing. And then we're also given reserve and surplus as a part of the shareholders fund or equity. I'm not really concerned about the money received against the warrants. And then you can see that we are given the non-current liabilities and we're given the current liabilities. Now, uh, basically what you notice on the format of division one is that you start with the equity and liability. And you can say the balance sheet on the liability side is segregated in terms of two major components. One is called equity and the other is called liability. And the liabilities have been further segregated in terms of non-current and current liability. Well, for basic understanding, we can say that when you're looking at uh, you know, non-current and current liability, you can say liabilities which are payable you know, more than a year's time is non-current 
and liabilities which are payable within a period of one year uh, generally current in nature though there is a complete insight you know which is elaborated how do you decide whether it is current or non current because it depends upon the operating cycle of the business as well but i think i'm not uh, getting into all those details at the moment uh, but per se you know when you consider that a liability is current or non current it is simply based on the distinction something which is payable within a year's time is current and something which is payable after a year's time is supposed to be non current in nature and similarly if you have a quick look in terms of the assets uh, the same segregation has been done on the asset side as well the asset side has been bifurcated in terms of non current assets as well as the current assets so the main structure in terms of the balance sheet which is given in division 1 is you know segregating equity and liability so you can say equity and liability is like uh, you know equity is like an own fund and liability is like a loan funds a company always works on two kinds of funds one is the loan fund and one is the own fund so when you say it's an own fund it is supposed to be uh, the equity and when you say it's a loan fund it is supposed to be a debt that's called a liability the liability as well as the assets have been further segregated in terms of current and non current in nature now i think let's take you to the division 2 and let's have a look at you know what is the format in terms of the division 2 you can see a little contrast in terms of the starting point where you can see that under you know division 2 we've got uh, first of all we start with the asset side unlike the division 1 which begins with the equity and the liability you know this starts with the, the asset side of the balance sheet now that does not make any difference as such you know because uh, we always know that the assets and liabilities are equal so whether you say you know begin with the asset side of the balance sheet that that would not make any technical difference as such but the division 2 as you can notice begins with the asset side we've got the same segregation a non current assets as well as a current assets but now something very interesting to watch in terms of the division 2 now hear this very carefully because this is a, a you know a very interesting thing to watch in terms of division 2 you know if you concentrate on the non current assets i think let me zoom it a little further so if you concentrate on the you know a uh, non current assets you can see something very interesting uh, you can see point number a to point number g uh, don't look at items in between but just have a look that there is item a to g and there is there is something you know new a new terminology altogether in point h and that is called a financial assets you know this term in terms of financial assets is not there in terms of division 1 it is only the division number 2 which you know segregates that non current assets are you know broadly i'm saying non current assets are broadly categorized in terms of financial and non financial assets now when you say financial and non financial assets you know the question what comes to mind is so what is a financial asset well you will be understanding these terms in more detail when you come to the specific indices like indices 32 and indices 109 talks about financial instruments which elaborates on the concept what is a financial asset but for the time being you can understand you know there are two kinds of assets in the balance sheet one is assets you know which give you a contractual right to receive money so i'm saying there are certain kind of assets where you can say that you would get a contractual right to receive money so when you get a contractual right to receive money it becomes a financial assets but not every assets would give you a contractual right to receive money like for example if you look at a property plant equipment let's say for example a machinery a machinery is capable of generating economic benefits we always say that you know a machinery would give you a future economic benefits you would produce goods out of the machine out of the machinery you will sell those goods and you would generate revenue out of them but it's not a contractual right to receive money we you know when you're looking in terms of property plant and equipment it is an asset which is capable of generating economic benefits and these economic benefits could vary as well you do not get any fixed kind of economic benefits from these assets so the thought process which is gone in terms of making 
you know, the division two is that we've segregated the non-current assets into a further bifurcation, you can say financial and non-financial assets. You know, typically one thing is very clear that when you look at the point number H, the point number H says financial assets. So when it says financial assets, of course, it is implied that point number E to G is not financial in nature. Because when I say H is, you know, a specific point which is devoted to financial assets, it is quite implied that point number E to G is something which is non-financial in nature. So you can say that the broad categorization in the balance sheet on the non-current assets is that item number E to item number G is something which is non-financial and point number H is something which is financial. Now let's dig into further in terms of point number E to G. If you look at in terms of point E to G, very carefully have a look at the point number A, B and C. Only see you know, what I ask you to see. I don't see too much further. So you can see the point number A, B and C. Now one thing common in terms of the point number A, B, C is they're all tangible in nature. You know, whether you look at A, whether you look at B or C, they're all tangible items in nature. Similarly, if you look at the point number D, E and F, just look at the point number D, E, F, you would see that point number D, E, F is something which is purely intangible in nature. So they made a very beautiful structure out of the balance sheet that, you know, when you start with the non-current assets, you've got three items which are devoted to tangible in nature. Then you've got another three set of items which is devoted to, you know, non-intangible in nature. So it's it's very simple and structured, the, you know, structured way in which a balance sheet has been created. ABC, which are tangible in nature. DEF, which is intangible in nature. Then point number G, you know, is a new entrant again. Uh, the term which you don't see in terms of division one. When you look at the division one, you would never see the term called a biological essence. Uh, I would not get into, you know, a too much detail that what is a biological asset, but just to give you a very basic input at this stage that what is a biological asset, I would say biological asset is supposed to be a living animal or plant. So when you say it's a biological asset, it means it's a living animal or plant. So which means, you know, they've made a very good structure in terms of balance sheet that you got three plus three plus one plus one. That's, you know, how easy you can easily correlate the format of the financial statements. Well, we can see the structure of the balance sheet is that non-current assets has been divided in, you know, ABC, which is tangible, then DEF, which is intangible, then point number G, you know, it brings out a new item altogether, and that's called a biological essence. You know, the logic is also why we are segregating these tangible and intangible items in the balance sheet is for the simple reason the measurement principles of these particular assets is going to vary. You know, when you look at the measurement of a biological assets, for example, it has got a different measurement principle, not to go in technical details, but, you know, there is a different index which deals with each and every item in terms of measurement principle. Like, for example, if you look at a property plant equipment, you've got India 16. You know, it deals with the measurement of this PPE. Like, for example, if you look at the investment property, we've got India 40, which deals with the measurement of investment property. Similarly, when you look at biological assets, for example, you've got index uh, 41, which deals with the measurement of biological assets, though it says other than bearer plants, because not all biological assets would be measured under index 41. So the basic idea, you know, the basic structure and putting these items, you know, uh, differently is because the measurement principles of these items is going to be governed with each and every separate index. So as I said, A would be India 16. And you know, the basic idea of telling you the number of these Indias and name is that, you know, you would also indirectly get familiar with the nomenclatures and the number of the Indias as well. So when you look at A, it deals with India 16, C deals with India 40, uh, other intangible assets and intangible assets under development would be India 38. Biological assets, as I said, is dealt in India 41. 
So now if you just you know look at the structure in which the asset side has been built, one thing is very clear that point number A to point number G, you know, I think I'll like to write this as well so that we can easily relate the structure of the balance sheet. So we can say that if you look at the uh, non-current assets of the balance sheet, you can see something very interesting, first of all, to begin with, that the segregation of the asset side is like this. It is item A to G. So when you look at the item A to G, it is something which is non-financial in nature. And I think just to retreat that when I say it is non-financial in nature, non-financial would mean that these assets do not give you a contractual right to receive money. These are assets which are capable of generating economic benefits in the future, but they do not give you any kind of contractual right to receive money. But when you look at the point number H, you can see in point number H, we've got financial assets. These are the assets which will give you a contractual right to receive money. So this is first, you know, you can say the first layer of segregation that we are segregating the non-current assets between non-financial and financial. Now, if you see further in terms of A to G, you can see the structure between A to G is like, you know, divided into a total of three sections. It's like A to B, A to C. When you look at A to C, it is tangible in nature. So we've got all assets which are purely tangible in nature. Similarly, when you look at the point number D to F, that is D, E and F, you can say they are purely intangible in nature. So tangible items are segregated in terms of A to C and then intangible items are put under point number D to F. And then there is a point number G, you know, which has got a new kind of assets, what you call a biological assets. So I think it is pretty simple. So we can say that, you know, one of the major differences in terms of division one and division two is division one was based on, you know, segregating the assets into current and non-current. It was like a one layer segregation that all the assets were segregated in terms of current as well as non-current in nature. But when you consider the division two, you know, it's got a little step further that it is segregating the assets in terms of current and non-current, and then further segregating the assets in terms of non-financial and financial. So the second layer of segregating the assets between financial and non-financial is something, you know, which is come in terms of division two. And I think it makes a complete logical uh, sense. You know, when you give more information to the stakeholders of the company, you tell them that these are the assets which are non-current in nature. These are the assets which are current in nature. And then you give them a second layer of information that out of these current as well as non-current assets, we are segregating, you know, which uh, assets are financial and which are non-financial in nature. So I think by now you've got a complete, uh, you know, input in terms of the asset side, only the non-current asset side, that it is organized in terms of three items being tangible, then three items being intangible, and then you've got one new entrant, which is biological assets. But all the points number E to G is falling under one particular head called non-financial. And then you've got a specific heading, you know, which is devoted to the financial assets. Now you could see a little examples in terms of you know the financial assets like we've got uh, trade receivables, we've got loans, and we've got investments. You know you can easily relate the trade receivables arises on account of credit sale. So the company has got a contractual right to recover money from its debtor. And similarly, when you're given a loan, loan is also a contract between two parties. So the entity which is given a loan would always have a contractual right to receive money. Similarly, when you make investments in a company, naturally you are under a contractual right to receive the money back from the company. So all these assets, whether they're investments, debtors, or they're supposed to be loan receivable, these are all assets which will give you, uh, you know, which will give an entity the contractual right to receive a money. And I can certainly also say that these items are going to be something you can say monetary in nature. 
the amount of benefits which you are going to derive from these financial assets uh, you know would be fixed in nature on the contrary when you look at items like a to g the amount of benefits which you would derive from these items is going to vary so you can say you know if you look at the way the balance sheet asset side is structured you've got items which are non monetary where the economic benefits is going to vary number 1 and it is not fixed but it is uh, and it is not uh, you know contractual in nature but when you look at the point number h you can see that the economic benefits will be fixed in nature that's one and you've got a contractual right to receive now another very interesting inputs which you can see is pertaining to a deferred tax asset when you look at the point number a to h now i'm looking at the point number a to h so when you look at the point number a to h in terms of point number a to h they are all assets which are actual assets in nature but you know when you look at deferred tax asset it is not an asset which is supposed to be you know an actual asset we you already know with your knowledge at the intermediate level that deferred tax asset is not something you know which you can recover from the government it is something which we call is a notional asset in nature so i think it's a very wonderful presentation that you know in point number a to h they have shown all the assets which are actual in nature and then point number h shows something which is notional in nature so i think if you just want to connect this in terms of the notes so we can say these are all supposed to be actual assets these are all supposed to be actual assets and then you can see we've got another item which is a notional asset and this notional asset is what is given in terms of point number g what we call a dta and another very in, you know important input which i like to say at this stage a deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability you know irrespective you're looking at a dta or you looking at a dtl uh, for the purpose of the schedule 3 balance sheet there is division 2 the always non current in nature we don't treat a dtl or a dta as current in nature uh, you know this fact is also endorsed in terms of indes 1 uh, the indes 1 which deals with presentation of financial statements also categorically tells us that a deferred tax asset liability is always non current in nature so keep that in mind that uh, you know we are segregating the assets if you look at the broader category i will i'll tell you you know after i finish with my discussion what is the broader outlook in terms of the asset side of the balance sheet is like you know segregating the non current and the current assets then the non current assets is being segregated in terms of you can say actual as well as notional in nature and i would also say that there is another input where you can say it's a, there is a residuary head as well there is a residuary head as well and this residuary head is you know given g uh, a g h uh, this is sorry i not g this is i and this is j so now i think if i want to connect you back on in terms of the asset side just focus on the non current assets and you'll see something very interesting the non current assets i'm focusing only on the non current assets not on the current assets so you can say the non current assets is segregated majorly in terms of you can say a to h which is like actual assets mind the words like a to h is like the actual assets then i would say the item number i is notional in nature and the point number j is something which is residuary in nature so you can say there is you know a three broad divisions of the non current assets mind it i'm not saying current my focus is only on the non current they made you know three major categories on the non current assets one is the actual assets that is a to h what is the notional assets that's point number i and what is the point number j which is the residuary head now if you get you know dig further in terms of the actual assets we can say the actual assets is segregated in three components a to c is supposed to be tangible then d to f is supposed to be intangible the g is a little new entrant which is in terms of the living animals or plant and the point of h is supposed to be financial in nature 
So the way, you know, the balance sheet is being structured is giving a lot of inputs uh, to the stakeholders of the company that when you read the balance sheet of a company, the asset side is telling you all the vital elements of the asset side. What is actual in nature? What is notional? What is residuary in terms of actual? What is tangible, intangible, as well as, you know, something which is uh, a new entrant like biological assets? So this is on the asset side. So I think let's do one thing. The best way to look at the asset side of the balance sheet to begin with, you know, I could do something like this. When I look at the asset side of the balance sheet, I would say that there is a major division on the asset side. One is the non-current and one is the current. We have yet to touch upon the current assets of the balance sheet. We are focusing on the non-current assets. And I would say when you look at the non-current assets, there are three broad, you can say, segregations. And we can say in terms of the first two, uh, we can say that we've got uh, something which is non-financial. So we can say there is a non-financial segregation. Look at this chart very carefully. You'll get a very good hang in terms of how the you know non-current assets is structured. And then you've got something which is financial. Then you've got something which is financial. And then we can say uh, that there is a something which is residuary in nature. So rather, let me, let me put it like this. Uh, okay, I think let me make a slight little changes further. I rather like to put it like this to make it more uh, elaborative. Uh, let's put it like this. So we can say if you look at the entire structure of the balance sheet, uh, we can say we've got first of all, uh, you can say the items which are non-financial. So items which are non-financial, they have taken two arrows on this. Items which are, you can say, uh, financial and then you can see items which are notional. So this is how the structure of the balance sheet has been done. Uh, these items are of course actual assets in nature. So I think if I leave the residuary head, if I leave the residuary head, you can see we've got actual assets and we've got notional assets. Now when you look at the non-financial assets, we've got like item number A, to item number C. So if you look at the items A to C, this is something which is tangible in nature. And similarly, when you look at the items number D to item number F, you can see these items are intangible in nature. So these are certain things which are purely intangible in nature. And then there is a little new entrant in terms of the point number G which is called a biological asset segregated from tangible and intangible. Uh, we are not saying that, you know, biological assets are not tangible in nature because living animal or plant would also be tangible in nature. But all the non-financial assets have been segregated in terms of tangible, intangible and biological assets. Then there is a point number H, which is totally devoted in terms of financial assets. And uh, then you can say notional assets, the deferred tax asset has been organized. So this is how, you know, the uh, thought process of the uh, Schedule 3 set setters have been there. You know, they have broadly divided the balance sheet first into a current and a non-current. That's one. Then they've segregated, you can say, the uh, non-current portions into three major heads, or you can say first into two major heads. One is the actual and then is the notional assets. When you look at the actual assets, it's segregated in terms of non-financial and financial. And then you've got the notional assets, which is a DTA. So it's a very beautiful way of presenting the balance sheet of a company, you know, where we are segregating the information into layers of information where you're presenting, you know, actual assets into further parts and you're presenting the notional assets and there is a residuary head as well. I think with that particular connect, uh, let's come back and now let's go on to the current asset side. Now, if you look at the current assets, 
the segregation is broad enough and not divided, you know, into too many subheads in terms of current assets. We've got inventories, that's one. And you've got B financial assets. So one thing is very clear that when you look at the item number B, which is financial assets, so it is pretty clear that A is supposed to be non-financial in nature. So item number B is financial, so A is non-financial in nature. So there is A, which is non-financial, B, which is financial. And can you see the, again, the input that we given in point number C, the current tax asset. Now, current tax asset is something, you know, which is like an advanced tax, which is net. So net means it is net for provision for tax. So what they've done under the current assets is they've segregated the, you know, uh, assets related to the government separately. So like, for example, the major uh, input in terms of the current assets would be your advanced tax. So that has been segregated under a separate heading point C. A is like the non-financial, B is like the financial, and they've segregated the government aspect separately. Just like the non-current assets, they've segregated the deferred tax asset. Similarly, under the current assets, you know, they've segregated the advanced tax asset. And D, you know, on the same lines, has been taken as a residue head. So if I would connect this in terms of the current assets, I would put it like this. That the current assets is, you know, broadly you can say the current assets is broadly segregated in terms of three category. A is like non-financial item, just inventory is there in that, that is non-financial in nature. And then we've got you know, B item, which is financial. So A is non-financial, B is financial, and C is relating to income tax. Though this is not something which is notional, it is, of course, an actual asset because this is an advanced tax, which you can you know, always set up against the income tax liability. So this is how the structure of the balance sheet you know, is organized in terms of division two. Uh, well, the idea is not to make you, you know, experts in this particular field, but I think by the end of the discussion today, you will definitely feel more confident you know, when you look at the division two balance sheet, where you would see that when you focus on the asset side of the balance sheet, on one hand, you've got the non-current assets. On the other hand, you've got the current assets. That's like, you know, the one level of segregation. Then, you know, the non-current assets have been segregated in terms of the actual and the notional assets. The actual assets have been segregated in three portions. One is, you can say, the tangible non-financial assets. Second is the intangible non-financial assets. And third is, we can say, the biological assets. And in terms of the financial assets, there is a separate list. And then you've got the notional assets. Similarly, the current assets have been segregated into a three layer information, financial, non-financial first, inventory, then financial, and then the income tax related assets. That is on the asset side. Now, I think let's uh, have a look now further on the liability side of the balance sheet. Now, when you look at the liability side of the balance sheet, I think first I need to take you to the division one and then I think I'll come to the division two because you need to look at the uh, comparative, you know, because we are indirectly making a transition from division one to division two, since you would be all familiar in terms of division one. So we're looking at, you know, once you go to the division two, what kind of, you know, changes do you look at? Now, earlier also, when I started off the inputs, I said, you know, that there is an equity and there is a liability. Now, when you say there is an equity, it is called a shareholders fund. And you can notice under shareholders fund, you've got a share capital and there is a reserve and surplus. Now, one very important inputs, uh, which you would recall in terms of division one, when you say share capital, it is both equity and preference share capital, which comprises of the share capital in division one. But if you notice in terms of division two, uh, you will notice in terms of division two, it simply says equity share capital. It does not say share capital. So unlike division one, where it says it is share capital, the wording used in division two is supposed to be equity share capital. Now, this would make it very clear that preference share capital under division two in this is not an equity. Now, I will not get into, you know, the technical explanation at this stage, but once you come to the, you know, various individual in days, because generally 
I have a habit, you know, when I am discussing the individual Indias, I generally try to connect you back in terms of Schedule 3. So, in this particular case, uh, you would notice that preference share capital by virtue of Indias on financial instruments most of the time would be considered as a liability. It would not be equity. Under the Indian scenario, the features with which the preference shares are issued, you know, generally become, uh, you can say, a liability. And they would be coming under the head liabilities, that is financial liabilities. Typically, they would appear under the head borrowings. So one major change in terms of the Division 1 to Division 2 is that when you're looking at Division 1, the Division 1 takes the equity and the preference share capital both into the share capital. But when it comes to Division 2, it considers only the equity share capital. Preference share capital in, in most of the cases would never appear as a part of the equity share capital. It would be a financial liability borrowings. And then you can see another transition change. Uh, you know, if you look at the division one, it says reserve and surplus. But when you look at the division two, it says the word other equity. It is, you know, quite similar to the concept that in division one, you say it's reserve and surplus. And in division two, you say it is uh, other equity. But there is a, you know, a complete uh, a structure, a complete format of other equity. Now, what I'm about to show you is going to be slightly dangerous to look at. Uh, I'm not going to explain you those components as well, but the idea is to expose you to another very interesting statement in Division 2. Attached to the balance sheet of every company, you would see another statement, and that is called SOC. Uh, the term is called SOCE, that is called Statement of Changes in Equity. Now, if you look at the point number A and B, in equity, it says equity share capital is point A and other equity is point B. Now, what I'm about to show you is going to look very dangerous. Uh, but the idea is just to give you a little explanation without getting into uh, the nitty gritties. Uh, so you can see that there is a statement called statement of changes in equity. So we you know, properly call it in a short form as SOCE that is called a statement of changes in equity. So there are two components of equity in the balance sheet, as you've seen, uh, A is the equity share capital. So this is an explanation of the point number A. The point number A gives you the movement of the equity share capital of the company. What is the balance at the beginning? What is the balance at the end? And what has been the movement of the share capital during the year? Is there been any fresh issue of equity shares? Is there been any buyback? So whatever is the movement, it gets reflected in point A. Now, if you look at the point number B, oh my God, this would look quite scary, uh, but don't look at this, uh, you know, with a very technical eye at this stage. This is the explanation of uh, the second component of equity in the balance sheet, and that is called other equity. It looks huge and it looks scary at this stage. And I think without having a little understanding of the Indies, one would not really appreciate this. But of course, you know, as I said, generally, when I cover the Indies, I would generally, you know, relate it back to the Schedule 3. We'll keep doing the Indies and keep relating it, you know, how the things are recorded in these financial statements. But as you can see, the broad the headings in terms of other equity, that it is giving you a detailed insight of each and every element of reserve and surplus and a plethora of other things. Uh, and I'm not looking into any details on this. But you can say this is another change in terms of Division 1. In terms of Division 1, there was nothing called, you know, a statement which we used to prepare showing you information about the reserve and surplus of the company. But Indus in Division 2 has introduced a complete new statement, what you call a statement of changes in equity, which gives you a movement of each and every component, you can say per se, of the reserve and surplus. So this was just to show you, but I think we're not getting into the details of uh, this element right now. So which means uh, when you look at the liability side of the balance sheet, we begin with equity and liability. So the equity has got two components, equity share capital and other equity. And the detailed information of this equity is available in the form of a statement of changes in equity. That's all what you need to know at this particular stage. Further, you know, if you look at the liabilities, the way, you know, uh, the assets have been segregated in terms of current and non-current, 
Here also, the liabilities have been segregated in terms of current and non-current. And as I said, you know, we further segregate the liabilities in terms of financial and non-financial in nature. Division 1 used to segregate the assets and liabilities in current and non-current. That's it. But when it came to Division 2, you know, they went into a further input. They said assets, liabilities are current, non-current and further segregated in terms of financial and non-financial. And of course, uh, the meanings would be same. When you say it's a financial liability, it means there is a contractual obligation to pay. And when you say it's a non-financial liability, there would be an absence of a contractual obligation to pay. Uh, like, for example, if I have to pay taxes to the government of India, so it is my obligation, but it is not a contractual obligation. So it is not a financial liability, but it is supposed to be a statutory obligation. So what the division number two has done, you know, they've given the inputs that we give more information to the stakeholders of the company, tell them that the company has got liabilities which are current and non-current and further give them information that they're financial or non-financial. So if you look at the uh, non-current liabilities, you can see the point number A is financial liabilities, the contractual obligations to pay. And then you can see the point number B is talking in terms of provisions uh, with these obligations. Uh, you know, these are basically provisions which are created, but they may not represent necessarily, you know, uh, contractual obligations. So you can say it's like non-financial liability. Then the way in the asset side, they have segregated the notional assets. In a similar way, you know, on the liability side, they have segregated the notional liability. So you can put it like this. You can say <laughs> under the non-current liabilities, there are four heads. A is financial liability. B is non-financial liability. C is a notional liability. Because as I said earlier, a deferred tax asset, a deferred tax liability, a purely something which is, you know, notional in nature. So you can say that point E and B are actual liabilities and point C is like a notional liability. And then you can say within the actual liabilities, they've segregated the financial as A and non-financial as B. And D, as usual, is being, you know, the residuary heads where they are reflecting the leftover liability. So I guess if I like to connect back in terms of the notes. So I would say when you look at the liability side of the balance sheet. So not the equity portion, but if you just look at the liability side of the balance sheet. I would say there is a non-current liability and there is a current liability and the non-current liability is being segregated into two major components. One is you can say there are actual liabilities and one is you can say it is supposed to be a notional liability. Well, I'm not considering the you know residuary head. I'm just leaving the residuary head. So you can say broadly it is actual and notional liability. So actual liabilities have been segregated in terms of two items. One is financial and one is non-financial. This is how the structure of the balance sheet is done. A is financial liability, B is non-financial and C is notional. D, of course, is residuary in nature. But I'm not putting that in this segregation at the moment. So this is on the non-current liability. Similarly, let's have a look on the current liability and they've done the, you know, absolutely similar kind of segregation. Even if you look at the current liabilities, you can say A is financial, a B is other current liability. So interestingly, the residuary head is being put in between. So we can say A and B is like actual liability. C is also actual and D is also actual. In the current assets and in the current liabilities, you'll never see any notional liability. The presence of a notional asset and the presence of a notional liability in terms of DTA and DTL is always non-current in terms of division two. The current assets reflects only, you know, purely items which are, you know, actual in nature. But you can see in terms of current liability, A is like financial, B is residuary, C is like non-financial liability provisions, and D is like, you know, related to the income tax. So here again, the liabilities has been segregated into four major categories. So they have segregated, you can say, four major categories. 
A is in terms of the financial liability. B is in terms of residuary. C is in terms of the non-financial liability, the provisions. And D is something which relates to income tax. So now, I think if I just try to connect myself in terms of balance sheet, I think we spend a good time in terms of the balance sheet. So we can now quickly run through the balance sheet as per the division two, and let's have a broader outlook on the balance sheet. Then I think I'll take you to the income statement. So now if I stand and look at the balance sheet under schedule three, division two, I would say, you know, the Asset side begins first, followed by the liability side. Now, when I look at the asset side, just look at this. This is just going to be a summary of a discussion so far. So when you look at the asset side, it is segregated in terms of non-current and current. That's one. Then if you look at the non-current asset, it is segregated in terms of, now very carefully, you can say A to H. Mind the words, A to H. When you say E to H, it is actual assets. When you look at the point number I, it is notional asset. So the organization of the balance sheet is A to H is something which is actual. And then you can say I is supposed to be notional. And J, of course, is something which is residue in nature. Now, within A to H, you can say there are three, four major segregations. A to C is tangible. Then D to F is intangible. G, there is a new entrant called a biological assets. And H is again a new entrant, which is financial assets. So we can say A to G is all non-financial and H is financial. So you can say the actual assets comprising of A to H. I repeat, the actual assets comprising of A to H then the non-financial comprising of A to G and financial is comprising of H. The non-financial is segregated into three components, tangible A to C, intangibles D to F and biological asset. That is how the non-current assets is segregated. And if you look at the current assets, we said there are mainly four headings. One is you can say non-financial A, then B is financial, then any kind of income tax related assets is C, whereas duty is D. And then when you look at the liability side of the balance sheet, liability side, we can say that we've got equity. Equity is comprising of two major components. One is equity share capital and one is other equity. And the bifurcation, the huge detailed information of this equity is available in the form of a new document, what you call SOKE, that is statement of changes in equity. Then the liabilities has been segregated as usual in terms of non-current and current liability and the segregation of both the non-current liability and the current liabilities is again done into four components. One is financial liability, one is non-financial liability, one is the income tax related items and one is supposed to be residuary. So whether it's a non-current liability or a current liability, there are four major groupings under which the liabilities has been done. Like A is financial. Then you can see B is non-financial provisions. C is notional and D is residuary. In the current liabilities also, we've got four components. One is A financial, B is residuary, C is supposed to be non-financial and D is income tax related matter. So this is how the entire balance sheet structure is being done under the division two. Now with this understanding, let's take you further and let's go to the income statement. Now I think before I take you to the income statement, I am again going to do some transition. So I'm going to first of all, you know, show you the income statement under division one because you're quite familiar in terms of division one. So I'm going to make a transition from division one to the division two. Now, there is something very interesting to watch in terms of division one. Uh, if you just concentrate on the initial part of the PNL, you can see in point number one, point number two and point number three. The point number one says revenue from operations and the point number two says other income and the point number three says it is total revenue. 
Now, if you ask me technically, this is not correct because the division one says that it is revenue plus other income. They say it's total revenue. Trust me, income is a wider term compared to revenue. Technically, if you ask me, the point number three should not say total revenue. It should say total income. But you will not see this uh, you know, problem in terms of division two. If you see in terms of division two, they've done absolutely you know, correct terminology. You can see the point number one is same. The point number two is exactly the same. And the point number three says total income. So whether it's division one or division two, so you can see the division one is calling the point number three as a total revenue and the, the division two says it's a total income. The correct terminology is that we should call it as a total income because income is supposed to be a wider term compared to revenue. The revenue is what you get from the sale of goods and rendering of services and other income is supposed to be like, you know, interest, other dividends, income, etc. So whatever is earned, not from the, you know, uh, operations, not from the sale of goods and services. Uh, quite similar, the structure is quite similar, but I think I like to show you, you know, where the differences comes in. So if you notice, uh, I'm coming back to division one again. If you look at the division one, the point number five, it says profit before exceptional, extraordinary item and tax. So division one says in point number five, this is the profit before taking exceptional items, before taking extraordinary items and tax. But if you go to division two, look at the point number five in terms of division two. And the point number five in division two says uh, the profit before exceptional items and tax. It doesn't use the word extraordinary item. So you will notice it only says that it is a profit or loss before exceptional and tax. Where is the element of extraordinary item gone? Now, this is another change from the accounting standard to the Indias. There is nothing called extraordinary item in terms of Indias. You know, there was an extraordinary item concept under accounting standard five, but in India, there is nothing called extraordinary. So there has been a complete deletion of the concept of extraordinary item. The rest of the items are quite similar, but I think I'd like to show you something now very interesting to watch. Now, look at this uh, in terms of point number 12. Look at in terms of point number 12. Uh, rather point number 13, the point number 13 says profit or loss for the period. Just look at the point number 13. It says profit or loss for the period. Let me take you to the division one. If you look at the point number 15, I'm saying division one point number 15, it says profit or loss for the period. So when you take the profit loss for the period, you calculate the earning per share based on the profit or loss for the period. Now, if you look at the division two, there has been a new introduction and that introduction is called other comprehensive income. It is called other comprehensive income, but we call it as OCI. There was no concept of other comprehensive income in terms of the division one. This is absolutely a new concept introduced in terms of division two. Now, hear me very carefully because what I'm about to tell you is slightly technical, but at the same time, it'll give you a good insight. You know what the Indus has done? Indus has actually segregated the income statement into two components. Though these components are not, uh, you know, are not two different segregations. It's a part of one single format itself. So, but I would say that what the index has done in division two, they've segregated the income statement into two components. One is point number 13 that says profit or loss for the period. And one is point number 14, which says other comprehensive income. Now, don't get bothered at this stage, you know, what enters the other comprehensive income. But I'll just give you, you know, what is the logic in terms of this other comprehensive income? When you calculate the earning per share of the company, when you calculate the EPS of the company, there is a point number 13, there is point number 14, and there is a point number 15 which says total comprehensive income. The point number 15 is a sum total of point number 13 plus 14. So whatever comes in 13, whatever comes in 14, you add 13 plus 14 and you get the point number 15. 
But when you calculate the earning per share, you consider only point number 13. What enters the other comprehensive income does not impact the earning per share of the company. Which means earlier, if you look at the division one, every income and expense used to be taken to the income statement. If every income and expense used to be taken to the income statement, the profit or loss used to get affected. The profit loss used to get affected and the earning per share was also affected. I put that once again. It's a little technical, but a very interesting thing to watch. In terms of Division 1, Accounting Standard 5 also very categorically said that all items of income and expense are to be taken in the profit and loss computation. So if you take all the incomes and expense in the profit and loss account, it consequently impacts the earning per share as well. But India made it a little more logical that agreed it is a part of the profit and loss, but there have to be certain items which will not affect the earning per share. So if somebody says, what is the total profit or loss under division two, I would say point number 15. You add the point number 13 plus the point number 14 that is including OCI and you say in terms of point number 15 that this is the total comprehensive income. But when it comes to the earning per share, I would take point number 13 and divide it by number of shares to get the earning per share. I will not consider items which are taken in terms of point number 14. So we can say there has been a broader difference that in terms of division one, we had, you know, a single figure of profit. Now, in terms of division two, you can say it's like, you know, two figures of profit. So you can say one is the point number 13 and one is what enters the other comprehensive income. And then you get the total profits and what enters the earning per share is point 13 and not point number 14. So, you know, when you're studying these Indias, you know, you should also think, you know, when the particular Indias tells you that this item is taken in the other comprehensive income, you could easily relate it to the logic that, you know, perhaps the accounting standard setters had a thought process that this item should not impact the earning per share. That is the reason they say that it is to be taken in the other comprehensive income. Now, without getting into a little technicality, you can see in terms of point number 14, you know, it is again being bifurcated in terms of two items, A and B. When you look at the point number 14A, it says items that will not be reclassified to PNL. And if you look at the point number 14B, it says items that will be reclassified to PNL. So uh, I would not get into much details at this stage, but I can only tell you one thing. Items which enter in 14A, hear this very carefully. Items which enter into the point number 14A would never, never, ever go to point number 13. But, you know, items which enter into point number 14B would, under certain circumstances, enter the point number 13. So it is at a later years that you would see that items which goes in 14A would not enter the point number 13 ever. But items which enter the point number 14B would enter the profit and loss as well. So now look at the catch very interestingly. This is something, you know, which you need to hear with a very careful, uh, carefully. So what I'm saying, what enters in point number 13 affects the profits of the year and impacts the EPS for the current year. I repeat, what enters in point number 13 impacts the profit for the year, impacts the EPS for the year. What enters the point number 14 impacts the profit for the year, but does not impact the EPS of that year. Now, within that, in terms of point number 14A, what enters in point number 14A would never impact the EPS of the future years as well. But what enters in terms of point number 14B is going to impact the EPS of the future year. So, you know, there are three kind of items one could, you know, keenly look into. If somebody says, I want the profits of the year to be affected and the earning per share to be affected, I'll say put it in point number 30. If somebody tells me that, you know, there is an item which I need to put it, you know, which I want the profits to be affected, but EPS not to be affected, never to be affected, I'll say put it in 14A. 
And if it says that I want the profits to be affected, but I don't want the EPS of this year to be affected, but I want the EPS of the future years to be affected, I'll put it in point number 14b. So the standard setters must have had, you know, this kind of a thought process when in different Indias they were you know, very clearly written, you know, which items are going to be recorded at which particular place. So one can very clearly say that, you know, if you want that the profits and the earning per share of the current year should be impacted, take it to point number 13. If you want that the profit of this year is impacted, but EPS neither of this year nor of the future years is impacted, take it to point number 14a. And if you want the profits of this year to be affected, EPS not of this year, but future years to be affected, then you take it to point number 14b. Now, this must have been a little slightly technical inputs which I gave you, but you know, you'll get a little more understanding when you progress with the, you know, the Indies, when you're going to study the Indies in detail, you'll be able to connect all these things. So my piece of advice is, you know, when you're going to study the uh, Indian, uh, the Indian accounting standards, you must always relate the Indies in terms of Schedule 3. Whatever is your understanding on each and every index, you know, try to connect it to Schedule 3 because at the end of the day, once you've done all the index, then you would be in a comfortable position in terms of making a complete set of financial statements. So all said and done, you know, if I just try to give a little uh, list in terms of the changes which has come from a division one to a division number two, I would put it like this. You know, when you look at the division one in terms of balance sheet, First, we'll discuss the balance sheet and then the income statement, a quick review. So when you look in terms of Division 1, the balance sheet, we can say Division 1 said assets, liability, current, non-current. Division 2 said, let me get into a broader detail, assets, current, non-current, further segregated in terms of financial and non-financial in nature. That's one. Secondly, there was nothing called a statement of changes in equity in Division 1. There is a new entrant in terms of Division 2, which gives you a broad information about the movements of the share capital and the movements of the reserve and surplus in the form of a statement called statement of changes in equity. And then you can see in terms of the income statement comparison, you know, first of all, we can say that division one used to call total revenue, but division two calls it as a total income, which is the correct terminology. Similarly, when you look at the division one, you know, it nothing, it never had a concept of other comprehensive income. But if you look at the concept in terms of division two, it has introduced something called another comprehensive income and the important element is what enters the other comprehensive income does not enter the calculations of the basic EPS. Well, I'm not taking the income statement too much in depth at this stage, so I've given you a very basic overview in terms of Schedule 3. So in terms of a shift over from Division 1 to Division 2, but just before we close, let me also tell you that there is a Division 3 also in terms of Schedule 3. And that Division 3 is supposed to be dealing with NBFCs, non-banking financial corporations, which are also required to follow India's. They've got a separate set of financial statements under Division 3. Right, friends. So I think that was a, a quick analysis today on the Schedule 3. So I hope uh, that gives you a little better insight. You become more uh, knowledgeable in terms of what you've discussed. So this must have been a, a helpful discussion. So thank you all for joining in. And uh, I think we'll keep getting, we'll keep connected with you with some more uh, uh, YouTube sessions coming in. So thank you. Stay tuned. And I take leave from you. I think no questions at the moment. So I think I'll take leave at this stage. Thank you, take care and goodbye.